Hello, welcome to our Bible study during this uh, week prior to the coming of Christmas. I hope you're already enjoying the Christmas spirit, and I hope that God is, is working a work of grace uh, in your heart during these days. I, I hope that you won't get so uh, caught up in the busyness of uh, shopping, even if it has to be shopping online, which is what most of ours has been this year. Uh, I hope that you won't be distracted from uh, the the true uh, spirit of Christmas and the true reason why we celebrate Christmas. Let, let Jesus be at the top of the list. Uh, I know you, <laughs> most people make a lot of lists at this time of the year, uh, lists for gifts, uh, lists for food that you're going to have at your home. Uh, lists of uh, people that are going to come and all those kinds of things or places you're going to go, uh, even though that list may be a little shorter this year. Uh, but at, at the top of every list that you make during this Christmas season, uh, put Jesus there at the head of that list, and uh, it'll, it'll help you to keep the focus uh, right where it needs to be for this season. Uh, certainly, uh, this lesson, since this is the one that we would uh, use on uh, this coming Sunday, December the 20th, and uh, I, I'm just so sorry that we cannot meet together either as a class or uh, whatever uh, uh, to, to celebrate uh, Christmas together, but uh, we, do, we do what we have to do during this time of uh, the COVID virus and hopefully soon so many people who might otherwise be infected will have the opportunity to have the vaccine. Now, if I sniffle and wipe my nose every now and then, you'll forgive me. It, it is the season for that too. Uh, we're looking at John chapter 1 today and uh, this is certainly the uh, the description on the part of John, which is, is different. His Christmas story is, is different from uh, Matthew and Luke, particularly, and even Mark, uh, because he just he takes a different approach in writing his uh, entire gospel. Uh, so uh, we're going to begin in just a moment with the reading of John chapter 1, and the title for our lesson today is the Word became flesh. The Word became flesh. And uh, even though I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 18, and then our focus is verses 10 through 18. So uh, let's pause and uh, direct our hearts and minds toward God. Father, thank you so much for this Christmas season, uh, Lord, and for your Word that makes it so clear and so plain to us why Jesus came into the world, your only begotten Son, uh, came into this world so that we might know you in a personal way as Creator, as Lord, as Savior. Uh, Lord, all of these different ways are described for us in your Word in the life of the Lord Jesus. Uh, we know that he he said to his disciples, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So, uh, Father, for those who struggle today saying, I don't really understand God, uh, help them to know that uh, uh, Jesus himself, he is the full embodiment of, of who the Lord God is, who you are, that uh, they can see it all in Jesus and in the pages of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, your word is all about Jesus. So God, uh, bless us now. Speak to our hearts out of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I want to share just a, a brief story with you that uh, is a familiar story. Um, Paul Harvey, who was a wonderful Christian man, would share this every year on his news broadcast. It's the story of the the man who chose to stay home on Christmas Eve rather than go to church with his family. And uh, he was a little depressed because he just, you know, Christmas sometimes has a way of doing that to some people. And uh, his family went on to the church and he sat there at his house wondering, you know, how 
how in the world could God possibly love him? How could God possibly uh, come into this world? He'd heard all of this preached and taught so many times, but there was something about him that just couldn't, couldn't quite grasp uh, the meaning and the fullness of Jesus coming into the world. So he sat there in his home, uh, and uh, there was a big picture window in the, in the room where he sat. And uh, after a few moments, he began to hear a thump, 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 uh, something hitting that window. So he got up to see what it was, and he looked out the window into the snow. And he saw several birds laying on the ground there. The snow was still falling. And uh, he realized pretty quickly that the, the birds were looking for a place of refuge to get out of the storm. And uh, because the birds could not see the glass, they thought that the house, the room where he was, was such a place that they could move into that room and find safety. And uh, he, he realized, oh, these poor birds, will they'll die. Uh, flying into the window, falling to the ground, and struggling to get up and try it again. Uh, I, I must do something to try to help them. Uh, so he puts on his, his coat and his boots, and he goes outside, and he begins to try to herd the birds toward the barn. Uh, the barn certainly would have been a wonderful place of safety for the birds, but they were afraid of him, and they would run from him, and the birds would just scatter so rather than being a help uh, to the birds, uh, it was just making matters worse. So finally, in frustration, he just got down on his knees and he said, God, if, if there was some way that I could show uh, these birds that I don't want to hurt them, that I just want to help them, I want to save them. I want to rescue them. And as these thoughts were going through his mind there in the snow, suddenly the church bells began to ring out and and it dawned on him it occurred to him this is exactly what jesus was trying to do for us or did do for us he came into this world uh, in the form of flesh god's only son so that he could be one of us god in the likeness physically of man so that he could draw mankind into safety and salvation by demonstration, by showing exactly his love and the love of God and who he is. Uh, so what a beautiful story this is. It's one that's been told over and over again, and I'm sure you've probably heard it, but it's so appropriate uh, for this season. Now let's look at the scripture itself that describes exactly what we just talked about. John chapter 1 and verse 1 begins, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that, was, that has been created. Life was in him, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. Our pastor, Brother Andy, uh, preached last Sunday and talked about uh, the light and the darkness. Well, here it is in God's Word. The light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man named John who was sent from God. This is John the Baptist now that uh, he's talking about. He came as a witness to testify about the light, Jesus, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. That's, that was the message of John the Baptist, that the true light has come into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created through him. Yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own and his own people. Did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. The Word became flesh, verse 14, and, and of all the passages that you could read about 
Jesus' incarnation, this verse 14 here in John chapter 1 is the very high point of the incarnation of Christ and the way uh, God describes it to us. Verse 14, the word became flesh, the same kind of flesh that you and I have, and took up residence among us. We observed his glory, the glory as of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him and exclaimed, this is John the Baptist now, this was the one of whom I said, the one coming after me has surpassed me because he existed before me. Indeed, we have all received grace after grace from his fullness. For although the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God the one and only Son, the one who is at the Father's side, he has revealed him. And this is what I was talking about just a moment ago, that we see God through Jesus Christ. When the disciples said, show us God and we'll believe, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen God. If you've seen me, you've seen uh, the Father. So this lesson today is in three parts. Uh, the first part, the Word came to give life to all who believe. Uh, that's verses 10 through 13 that we just read. The second part of the lesson, the Word came to reveal God's glory. The Word came to reveal God's glory, verses 14 and 15. And then last, the Word came to provide grace and truth verses 16 through 18. So I'm just going to walk you quickly through uh, this passage from John chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. This is called the prologue of the gospel, the beginning, the opening of the gospel here in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. And it reveals Jesus, the Word, as the Creator. When God's Son, Jesus incarnate, Jesus in the flesh. That's what incarnate means. Uh, he came into the world. The world he had created did not recognize him. He, he made everything in this world. That's what the passage that we just read uh, says. Uh, but his own creation did not recognize him. Now, the very first thing that Jesus would deal with when he uh, began his earthly ministry. He was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And immediately uh, he was taken into the wilderness. And there he was going to do battle with Satan because Satan had moved into a position and a belief in his own mind, this world is mine. This world is mine. This world operates by my rules and by what I say. And Jesus came into the world to defeat Satan and to overcome the evil that Satan was determined to do and that Satan demonstrated that he could do by bringing man into sin, just as we see back in Genesis chapter 1, uh, Adam and Eve, uh, the, the, you know, he tricked them, the Satan tricked them, the devil tricked them and made them believe that they did not have to do what God said they must do. They did not have to be obedient to God's rules. So right at the very beginning with the first man and the first woman, Satan comes into the picture and he says, look, I'm in charge here. Well, Jesus in his coming to earth is going to do battle with Satan and he's going to win. Folks, we, we know how the story comes out. Jesus wins. And he is going to show us that this is not Satan's world. It is his world. He created it, but even his own creation did not recognize him as the creator. Things had gotten so out of whack because of what Satan had done and what Satan was attempting to do uh, that uh, uh, it, it, it was just a mess. And Satan thought he could overcome Jesus, that he could... Uh, he could kill Jesus. That's what he was going to do. Well, 
He came into the world. The world he had created did not recognize him. Even his own people, not only did his creation that he made not recognize him, his own people. Now, who is that? We're talking about Israel here. And, and we're also talking about his people, his earthly family uh, that, you know, he grew up in Nazareth. Even they could not recognize him and at first were not willing to recognize that uh, this is Jesus. This is God's son. This is the Messiah. They couldn't even recognize and, and agree that that's who he was and they couldn't believe him because of that. Uh, trying to make sense of our life and our purpose for living uh, without Christ is absolutely futile. Uh, sometimes people say, I, I, you know, I, I just don't know what my life is all about. I just don't know what I'm going to do with my life. A lot of young people struggle with this uh, as they become teenagers uh, and then young adults. Uh, they, they, they think, what, what's my life all about? And folks, trying to figure that out without putting Jesus at the head of that picture, at the head of that list of all the things that, that I've got listed here that I might do or that I might become in this world. If Jesus is not at the head of that list, you can try to figure it out all you want to, but it will never, never become clear as to what purpose we have in this world apart from who Jesus is. The second part of our left, that was part one. The word came to give life to all who believe. The second part, the word came to reveal God's glory. Jesus came. He is the word. He came to reveal God's glory. From the Old Testament, uh, we see the word Shekinah uh, in, uh, in Hebrew. Uh, of the Old Testament, the glory of God. And it means that which dwells. That's what the word Shekinah means, that which dwells. Uh, when, uh, when God first began to uh, show himself in some way to uh, Israel, the, the people of this world, uh, if you go back over in, in Exodus chapter 16, uh, you see uh, God is showing them that he is going to be leading them into the desert and that he's going to take care of them in the desert. You remember the cloud, the cloud of fire by night, the pillar of cloud by day to give them protection. So this was the first uh, action on the part of God to reveal to Israel that he was with them and he was going to be the one leading them through the desert. When he gave instructions for them to build a tabernacle while they were still uh, in the wilderness, that 40 years of wandering around that they did because of their sin, he told them to build a tabernacle, gave specific instructions. And when they got it finished, they dedicated it, and the cloud descended on the tabernacle. Again, it was uh, a picture of the presence of God entering into Shekinah glory, that which dwells. He said, you've done what I ask you to do. Now I'm going to demonstrate to you that I'm going to dwell with you. And where the tabernacle is, uh, you'll know that I am there with you. Same thing when they built the temple. God told them to build a temple to honor him in a place where he might live here uh, among his people. And uh, when they dedicated the temple, the Shekinah glory of God filled the temple so much that the priest couldn't even go in. Uh, it was so full of the Spirit of God. Uh, you can see all of that over in, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 11 where they're dedicating the temple and where the Shekinah glory comes into that place. Uh, Isaiah in chapter 6 uh, talks about his experience in the temple and he says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Uh, again, he has one of those Shekinah glory experiences uh, in his life where God is, is uh, going to make himself known to the prophet Isaiah uh, and his glory. Uh, over in Ezekiel, again, we have in, in chapter 1, verse 28, we have the picture of uh, Ezekiel and 
the glory of God is being revealed to the prophet Ezekiel, the Shekinah glory of God, that which dwells. Jesus didn't just bring God's message when he came into this world. Jesus is God's message. If you go back and read Hebrews chapter 1 uh, uh, and 1 and 2, he starts out by saying, uh, in, in all the ages up to this point, uh, we had the prophets, we had those who uh, showed us uh, as much as they could who God is. They tried to describe who God is, but then Hebrews 1, chapters uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, but says, in these latter days, in these last days, we don't have to take somebody else's word for it because in these days, we have Jesus who has come and who is God and who is the picture of who God is. The life of Jesus Christ is a manifestation of the glory of God. Uh, Jesus' manifestation of glory uh, is is shown in a lot of different ways uh, in Jesus' ministry. You remember when he raised Lazarus from the grave. Uh, it was a manifestation there of the glory of God. Uh, glory is, that is uh, uniquely Jesus' own glory in so many places. Jesus' prayer at the end of his ministry, he's about to go to the cross. And uh, his prayer was that the Father would glorify him, that the people would understand that he truly was the Son of God, and that Jesus also transmitted his glory to his disciples uh, in a fashion to uh, allow them to know that they had the presence and power of God in their lives. The third part of our lesson is uh, comes from verses 16 through 18 of this passage that we read. The word came to provide grace and truth. It came to provide grace and truth. First of all, it came to the word. Jesus came to give life to all who believe. Secondly, the word came to reveal God's glory. And then third, the word came to provide grace and truth. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The picture of God the judge has now become uh, the picture uh, of God the lover of men's souls. And I want to read the, uh, just a brief paragraph to you from uh, William Barclay that describes this so clearly. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In the old way of life, life was governed by law. A man had to do a thing whether he liked it or not, and whether he knew the reason for it or not. But with the coming of Jesus, we no longer seek to obey the law of God like slaves. We seek to answer the love of God like sons. We seek to, uh, to see his love actually lived out before us. It is through Jesus Christ that God the lawgiver has become God the Father, that God the Judge has become God the lover of men's souls. What a beautiful picture uh, that is. John the Baptist was born into the world six months before Jesus, six months before the, the incarnation of Christ, his birth. Uh, his role was to prepare the way for the coming of Christ and to explain uh, that Jesus has been from the beginning. Uh, you know, John the Baptist didn't make any bones about it. He said he was from the beginning. In other words, John said, look, he's been with the Father. Uh, he, he's been since God ever was. Jesus was. Uh, he's been right there. He created everything that we see. He created man, all that we are. Jesus' incarnation, his coming in fleshly form into this world, uh, shows us the Father's glory full of grace and truth. That's what this passage says, full of grace and truth. What is grace? Well, we've known for a long time. Grace, uh, the description there usually is unmerited favor. 
an act of pure love on God's part. Pure love on God's part. That's grace. Beauty, beauty is a part of that grace. Uh, we would describe it in some ways as charm, the beautifulness of, of a person or the beautifulness of a, a, a place. Uh, you hear people saying, oh, that's just charming. Well, that, that's just one word to try to describe what grace is. It is the, the sheer winsomeness of God. All of the beauty and glory and love of God is shown through his grace. Then he said grace and truth. What is truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the truth. Not abstract. Not abstract but a picture, a perfect description of what truth is. Jesus shows us. He shows us who God is. He shows us who God is like, what he is like. Jesus himself was the perfect picture of God. He said that himself. Jesus is the communicator of truth. Know the truth. Know the truth. That's what Jesus says. If you know me, you know the truth. Jesus shows us the right way. You ever been in one of those problems where uh, you think, man, what, what do I need to do? What, what am I going to do? Well, Jesus says, if you follow me, I'm going to show you the right way. I'm going to show you the decision that you need to make because I am the truth. Uh, you, you, we can imagine a lot of things in our minds. We can imagine the, that, well, here's a way. A friend of mine, when I was in seminary, uh, said, Walter, uh, I, need to, I need to get together with you this afternoon. We need to talk. I, I've, got, I've got a decision I need to make, and I, I, I just don't know why. <laughs> well, he sat down with me. He said, there are seven opportunities, seven different ways that I could go right now, seven different things that are, are right in front of me, and I've got to make a decision out of all those seven things what to do. We talked about it. We prayed about it a while. I said, what's God telling you? What's God telling you? What, what is Jesus living in you? What's his Holy Spirit telling me? He said, <laughs> "He said, well, uh, I, I think I know, but, but you know, all these other things try to lie. I said, just, just let Jesus show you the way and let him show you the truth of what he has for your life, and he will do it. He enables us. His Spirit, remember we've talked about the Holy Spirit last couple of weeks, his spirit enables us to choose what is right and to make us free, to give us freedom. Once we have trusted him and uh, believed that he is going to lead us, then there's a freedom. Oh my goodness, isn't it, isn't it wonderful when we have struggled uh, with a matter and and then suddenly that well, we've made a decision, we believe we've made the one that God wants us to make, uh, then there, there's a freedom about it. And and even sometimes when we believe we've done it and we discover down the way somewhere, well, maybe this wasn't the right decision. Remember, the Holy Spirit's still with us. He's still with us even in, in those times. Grace upon grace is one of the phrases that is in, in this passage in verse uh, 16 through 18. Grace upon grace. What does that mean? It simply means this, when in our life's journey, uh, we come upon a, a place in our life where uh, God has shown us his grace. He's opened himself up to us and said, uh, look, this is what I want you to see. This is where I want you to go. This is what I want you to do. Oh, wow, what grace, what power, what glory that is uh, when he, he illuminates himself living in us and that's what he does that's what the holy spirit says. he's just illuminating who god is in us and then we 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 come to that place and we've got that joy and we think man it doesn't get any better than this but yet just beyond the next hill is grace that is even greater than that was grace upon grace you never run out of the grace of god you never run out of the grace of god don't ever forget that God is so full of grace. He gives us grace, and then he gives us more grace, 
more grace, more grace, marvelous grace of our loving God. <laughs> oh my, I love to sing that old gospel song. Well, the fullness of grace is what we're talking about here. <clears throat> it is a word that, that in the Greek text here is the word pleroma. It means the fullness of grace, the sum total of all that God is. And you have that description again in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, Colossians 2, and verse 9, the fullness of who God is. I want to read you again just a, a little passage here that, that gives such a beautiful description of, of all of this, of grace uh, and, and what that grace means. From him, we have received grace upon grace. Literally, the Greek means grace instead of grace or grace beyond grace. What does that strange phrase mean? It may mean that in Christ we have found one wonder leading to another, just like I was saying. One of the old missionaries came to one of the ancient kings in the area where he was serving God. The king asked him, and he'd been witnessing to the king, and the king asked him what he might expect if he became a Christian. The missionary answered, you will find wonder upon wonder, and every one of them will be true. Sometimes when we travel a very lovely road, uh, vista after vista, beautiful scene after beautiful scene uh, will open up before us. At every view, we think that nothing could be any more beautiful than this. Then we turn another corner and a new and even greater beauty opens up before us. When a man enters on the study of some great subject like music or poetry or art, he never gets to the end of it. There's always more. There's always more. Always there are fresh ex experiences of beauty waiting for him. So it is with Christ. The more we know of him, the more wonderful he becomes. The longer we live with him, the more loveliness we discover. Uh, what was that good song that came out of uh, you know, one of the musicals back in the 70s? The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, more love he bestows. Uh, each day is, is like wonder his grace he bestows the longer i serve him the sweeter he grows the longer we live with him the more loveliness we discover the more we think about him and with him the wider the the horizon of truth becomes this phrase may be john's way of expressing the limitlessness of christ it may be his way of saying that the man who companies with christ will find new wonders dawning upon his soul and enlightening his mind and enchanting his heart every day. It may be that we ought to take this expression quite literally. In Christ, we find grace instead of grace. We think, boy, it's so good. It can't be any better, but it always is. The different ages and the different situations in life demand a different kind of grace. We need one grace in the days of prosperity and another kind of grace in the, in the days of adversity. We need one kind of grace in the sunlit days of youth, and another when the shadows of age began to lengthen upon life. The church needs one grace in the days of persecution, and another grace in the days of acceptance. We need one grace when we feel that we're on the top of things, and another when we are depressed and discouraged and near to despair. We need one grace to bear our own burdens and another grace to bear one another's burdens. We need one grace when we are sure of things and another when there seems nothing certain left in the world. The grace of God is never a static but always a dynamic thing. It never fails to meet the situation. One needs one need invades life and one grace comes with it. That need passes and another need assaults us and with the other need, another grace comes. All through life, we are constantly receiving grace 
instead of grace, or grace upon grace, or grace after grace. For the grace of Christ is triumphantly adequate to deal with any situation. Oh my goodness, what a wonderful and powerful message from the Word of God here in John chapter 1. May God's grace be bountiful in your life as you celebrate this Christmas season, as you celebrate the coming of Jesus Christ into this world to bring grace upon grace, to bring the fullness of the grace and truth of God to us in a personal way that lives in our hearts. God bless you. Let's pray. God, thank you again that as you have come into the world, you created the world, then you came into the world to show us the Father, to show us what God is and how much God loves us. Thank you, Lord, that you are one who forgives sins, restores us, walks with us, energizes us, gives us grace every day, exactly what we need for that day. Lord, bless this Christmas season. And Lord, again, we lift up to you those that have been so hurt and those who have been so saddened by loss in these days uh, of the COVID virus. God, I pray that soon we'll be past this terrible, terrible point in our life. But help us to remember in dark days, grace is sufficient. Your grace is always sufficient. In Jesus' name, amen.